Hi, I'm Russ Reed and I'm the Executive Director of the National Center for the Biotechnology Workforce. We're actually located down in the Innovation Quarter at 525 Vine. That's another campus of um, Forsyth Tech. Um, very pleased today to be able to be here. Uh, this is um, our, our fifth uh, SciTech for this calendar year, for this fiscal, uh, this calendar year. And we'll have one more in April. And uh, SciTech uh, started nine years ago. Uh, and the whole idea behind it was generated from faculty and um, a few of us sitting around thinking it would be a good idea to be able to have a platform for students to interact with people from industry uh, to see what actually happens when uh, science and technology is taken into the workplace. So I'm, I'm pleased to tell you that, that our speaker today, and he's going to be introduced by Jason Gagliano, who's our lab coordinator down at the Innovation Quarter, uh, actually is speaker number 59. And uh, we've actually had 3,300 people attend SciTech over the ni past nine years. And um, what we do with SciTech is we actually YouTube it. So uh, at this particular time, there's a live link. And uh, our technicians from Foresight Tech here have actually got, got it up and running. So this is actually being broadcast. So what we do is we actually um, make sure that these are recorded and so anybody can access them. Uh, so they're good teaching tools. They're good learning tools for people who are looking to see what happens in industry and so forth. So um, I just want to thank you for coming. I think you've made a valuable investment. There aren't a lot of you uh, here today. We are in spring break. So we are just completing spring break. And a lot of people um, are in meetings and scattered today. But the good news is the lecture is recorded. And you guys are here. And I really thank you for doing that. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jason Gagliano. Jason is our lab coordinator of, over at the Innovation Quarter. And if some of you students at some point in time would like to come down and see our labs, please just email ourselves um, and let us know if you'd like to come and visit. We've got a tremendous lab there. We'd like to show you um, the potential of the lab. And uh, so let us know. And it's R. Reed at Foresight Tech or J. Gagliano at foresighttech.edu. Um, so uh, Jason Gagliano actually is a student himself too, and he's also uh, an instructor here at Foresight Tech and our lab coordinator. So a man of uh, many um, uh, tactics right now, and uh, he's actually completing his PhD at Wake Forest uh, University. So I'm, I'm really pleased to introduce to you uh, Jason Gagliano. Jason, thank you. Thanks, Russ. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Norman Fraley, our speaker today. Uh, we're hoping to do a lot of work with Norman at the uh, lab at Innovation Quarter. Just some highlights of his career. Uh, Mr. Fraley is currently the executive director of the Frolish Institute for Research in Sustainability Technology. In addition, he's co-lead faculty at Wake Forest University in their graduate program on the science of sustainability. Mr. Fraley has over 30 years of analytical chemistry experience. That experience covers nutrition chemistry, clinical diagnostics, toxins in water, space shuttle payloads, and method development in green chemistry for the better of humanity. And like myself, in his free time, he's a PhD candidate, but in chemistry, I'm in biology, also at Wake Forest. Now his theme today, you could see, is the physical and chemical properties of smoke. So let's welcome Mr. Fraley. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Russ. And thank all of you for not staying one more day on spring break. This talk is for you guys. They'll learn something too, but you guys were the ones who were in mind with all this. A little bit about the Frolich Institute, who we are. Uh, before we get rolling. We're a consortium of scientists and educators. We currently have 10 scientists and educators that are a part of the Institute who are available to do research work, to do consulting work, and do teaching work. We're a 501c3 charitable organization. We're 
file with the feds to be able to do that, to accept grants, to fund the research that these companies want to have done with the understanding that the results of the research will be shared with the entire world. Winston-Salem, yes, we're for Scythians, and newly working with the biotech lab in the innovation quarter, and this guy right here is gonna help make it all happen, so thank you, sir, too. Now, what we do, we do three things, research, education, and consulting. The research can vary quite a bit. I just picked out three little things that uh, we're currently working on. One of them is green chemistry. And with that, what we do is we find ways to make existing chemical methods less toxic, lower solvent use, lower chemical use, lower hazardous waste, more efficient, more energy efficient, more thermal efficient, things like that. A lot of the things that people have working right now, that companies have working right now, that makes their products work, may not have been looked at for some time about has the technology changed or has our understanding of chemistry changed such that it can be even better. We have another project working on what we call suburban sustainability. What can people who live in just regular suburban households do that actually make a difference in the carbon footprint on the planet? And if so, how big of a difference is that? Is it just a little bit? Is it a lot? Where does it matter? And one cool thing, uh, we recently uh, uh, partnered with a student at Wake Forest who received a grant from the Winston-Salem Arts Council. Now, what's art and science got to do with anything? Well, they want art in unexpected places, and one form of art is the art around agriculture. So through a urban garden project, a permaculture situation is being put up in downtown Winston-Salem in an abandoned lot that used to have a house on it where fruit trees and fruiting bushes are going to be growing there as if it were a little forest where all of the food and all the proceeds are available to anyone in the neighborhood whenever they want it. Plus, it would be a pretty chill place to just knock back and be quiet. So that'll be interesting to see how that develops over the next few years. And the thing that really led into the talk today is uh, there are lots of places in the rest of the world that have a need for technologies that help them in their homes to create better places inside their homes to be able to take care of their families. And uh, I lived for a year in Ethiopia and realized that there are a lot of things that we have and we know here that they need to know and to be able to have in a way that they can actually manufacture. And one of the technologies we're working on is biomass cook stoves that will enable them to both heat and cook inside their homes with the biomass materials that they have there. So an array of different things we work on. On the education side, stuff like this, workshops, uh, actually teach in the graduate school. Uh, in the fall for the science and sustainability. And then the institute works with people to give them access to the associates that are inside the institute for tapping into their individual expertises as well. I actually got asked yesterday, why did you do this? Is it because we got to do what we can to make this place, this world a whole better place. And discoveries need to be shared. Believe that. But the big thing is, we believe that when we use our personal strengths for the betterment of humanity, we are directly responsible for advancing civilization. And that's a big deal. Now, we're doing it through science, through chemistry, through biology, through protein work. What comes up next? We don't know. But we'll throw the resources at it to work at it. I'll ask you all the questions if that's okay during the course of it. Anyone been to the western side of the state? Recognize the Great Smoky Mountains. Who's been to the Smoky Mountains? Ah, oh, a few of them have. Is that smoke? Why do they call it the Smoky Mountains if it's not smoke? I don't get it. Belfast, Northern Ireland, is this smoke? Well, 
Okay. How about that? Ayafala Yokel. Oh, man, I butchered that. Beautiful, beautiful volcano. Anybody remember when this thing exploded in Iceland back in 2010? Shut down airports all across Europe for a couple of weeks. Yeah, that smoke. It's taken outside of a plane window flying over California around San Francisco, October last year. Wow. They've got some brutal wildfires going on out there. This was in the papers then. Fires, winds drive it, smelling it all the way down to Santa Cruz. Wow, how many people are from that part of California? Is Santa Cruz a long way away from the Bay Area? really far. It's that far. It's 115 miles. That smoke from a fire 115 miles away was smelled in Santa Cruz. How? <laughs> How's that even possible? How about this? These were the fires in western North Carolina. And if you look the smoke was all the way up in Louisville, Kentucky. And that's over 300 miles away from a fire. How? It's because our planet rotates and we get wind. This is a snapshot of what a typical January looks like on planet Earth. The colored areas are carbon dioxide. The gray areas are increased carbon monoxide. And this changes over time. With any luck, I might actually be able to change it a little bit right now. The nature of the seasons, the rotations of the planet, the heating of the Earth, all add Hi, to this work. This is Bill Putman. I'm a climate scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. What you're looking at is a supercomputer model of carbon dioxide levels in the Earth's atmosphere. The visualization compresses one year of data into a few minutes. In carbon theory. dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas affected by human activity. About half of the carbon dioxide emitted from fossil fuel combustion remains in the atmosphere while the other half is absorbed by natural land and ocean reservoirs. In the Northern Hemisphere, we see the highest concentrations are focused around major emission sources over North America, Europe, and Asia. Thank you, NASA guy. But I wish the video worked in that browser. Anyway, I recommend you go to the NASA site. They've got really cool videos on how to envision the stuff that's happening on the planet. We'll get to that in a bit. But because our planet rotates and we have winds that carry, that smoke can get all over the place. But it's not only the wind. We got smoke from little places too. Little fires. And people all over the world who are still using this to cook with. In 137 developing countries, they still cook this way. And that's every one of the developing countries. Smoke's all over the place. So, what we'll do about it? I found this article just in uh, December um, from Energy for Sustainable Build Development. And the quotes that he made on there, I thought was, was nice enough to share with you. That prior to 150 years ago, Wood and coal, that's what was used throughout the world. But it's changed over to electricity and natural gas. But close to three billion people on this planet have not been able to make that change yet. They're still using wood, dung, and coal to heat with and to cook with. And that means smoke. So 
we got indoor air pollution. All of the smoke is staying inside people's houses. What effect? Well, how many have either purposefully or accidentally had the smoke from a campfire fly into your face? Fess up, whether you remember it or not, at that campfire. <laughs> Pleasant? No. Imagine having that in your house all the time. Over four million people die prematurely from illnesses attributed to household air pollution each year. This is data from the World Health Organization's 2016 report. Four million people a year die from indoor house pollution, primarily from smoke. More than 50% of these premature deaths come from that soot that's inhaled inside the people's homes. For those of you in the medical fields, even you out there in the rest of the world, stroke, heart disease, these deaths, these 3.8 million deaths were directly attributed to exposure to household air pollution. How's that even possible? And why? Well, there's a simple little answer for why. It's called aerosols. Aerosols, just to start with our definition, a suspension of fine solid particles or liquid droplets in a gas. Can anybody name me some aerosols other than hairspray? Yeah, uh, bronchial inhalers, they create those things too. Aerosols are actually more common than you think. They can be natural or man-made. Natural ones, geyser steam, fog, dust, smoke. Forest exudates, well, there's a fancy word that says forests give off tiny particulate matter from the leaves and the plants in order to create what appears to be a smoke. And that's a primary cause of why our Smoky Mountains look smoky. And then there's human. <sighs> yes, aerosol come every time we exhale. They're that tiny. In the wintertime, you can see it. But we also create the haze and the smog, and also we make smoke too. The cool thing about aerosols is that they have mass. If you remember back in your chemistry class, anything that has mass and takes up space is matter, right? Aerosols are a combination of gas and solid floating around all together in a mix that doesn't separate on its own. And because these particles are so small and so light, the wind can take it with it wherever the wind wants to go. And that's how a smoke particle can go 300 miles. The other cool thing is it has mass, we can see it because we're clever. We have physics, we have light. Now, this is a snapshot map, so again, another one from NASA, where we've got a layout of a, just a snapshot of the globe of the size of the aerosols on the planet at this point in time compared to the concentration of carbon monoxide on the planet at that same point in time. That we can actually measure the percentage of small particles that are in the atmosphere of our planet at any given time. And that range is actually pretty big and depending on where you're at on the earth, what time of year you are on that earth, is how much additional things are in that atmosphere. Now, we have atmospheric challenges right now, right? Anybody got pollen issues starting to pop up? 
Yeah. Is pollen an aerosol? No. It's big. Does pollen settle out on your car? Yeah. Not an aerosol if it'll settle out. Just like dust settles out. Yeah, dust can get blown, but it'll still settle out. This is how we can do that. NASA's got a satellite up there, the Terra satellite. The instruments on that satellite are tuned down to watch this planet so that we can see things like what's changing on the land, what's changing on the ice, what can we see with aerosols and carbon monoxide. And at any time, you can go to the NASA site and you pull up the data that's coming down from Terra, and this is what they use to watch for overall understandings of the climate of the world, but also to watch for natural disasters. It's so cool to see hurricanes forming and being monitored underneath a satellite like this. Highly recommend you go look at it. Terra does this with the instrumentation that is on board. Now the question out there is how, and I'll give you a hint. The hint's light. Any guesses? What do they have on the satellite that will allow them to see aerosols? Time's up. Oh, public service announcement warning here. Lasers. We use lasers. Well, they use lasers. Don't look into the laser beam. Here's how lasers work in order to see aerosols. If you just shine a laser straight out to a light trap, if there's nothing in between it, all the light gets there and all the light gets detected. But because aerosols are made of tiny particles, they have mass, they actually deflect that light. And as soon as that light gets reflected off to somewhere else, that photon doesn't make it to the light trap. And so we can see how much didn't make it. And the more that didn't make it, the more particles that were in the way. Make sense? We can measure that through any gas that may have particulate matter in it. And what's more, the amount of that scattering can also give us an indication of what the size of those particles are that are in there. So, really, really, really quick health class, okay? Lungs, breathe, pipes go into your lungs. Lungs go into tiny, tiny little sacs. There's bronchial sacs, this tiny little one here called alveoli. Remember that from your health class? Air inside there is enough to be able to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide from your bloodstream into there. Now, a blood cell is about eight microns big or small. One, or sorry, eight millionths of a meter wide. Not real big. Blood cells, tiny. But these alveoli are tiny enough to allow those blood cells to take that, those gases back and forth. Relatively speaking, if you look at a fine sand particle compared to a human hair, this blue ball is 10 microns big. Smoke are the red ones, less than two and a half microns in size. Wow, that's small. Going back to here, how many of those two and a halves can fit inside here when this is eight? That's why smoke is so dangerous, because those particles are so small 
and they travel with the gases that are in the atmosphere and that we breathe, they don't just come into your mouth and stop, they don't stop in your throat, they go all the way down. They're that tiny. So, what's the big deal? Take a look at what smoke is comprised of. So now we're going to move into chemistry a little bit here. What is the most abundant organic material on this planet? Anybody? <coughs> most abundant organic material? No, it's cellulose. Cellulose is the most abundant organic material. And what all is made of cellulose? Anything that's a plant and anything that used to be a plant used to be cellulose. Coal used to be cellulose. Okay? Cellulose, when it burns, makes smoke. In fact, any organic material that burns makes smoke but it makes smoke whenever it burns incompletely. 100% efficient combustion gives you only water and carbon dioxide. And a few other little things, but no particles. Poor burning gives you particles, and that's what the smoke is. But the majority of the composition of that smoke, carbon dioxide, water, carbon monoxide, and some methane. That's the bulk of what's in that smoke. And these are in the gas phase but there's also those tiny particles we were talking about. There are hydrocarbons, other really complicated chemical compounds, nitrogen oxides, which our cars try to get up, and trace minerals. Now we've all heard how good our vitamins and minerals are, right? Where would minerals come from to get into the smoke? Because it comes from the plants and the plants get it from the roots, they get it from the soil, because the plants need minerals too. And a few thousand other chemical compounds that come from combustion and pyrolysis. Most recent numbers I have is about 4,000 organic compounds have been identified in smoke. And it might be a handful of them that aren't toxic. So, what it depends on is how it burns and what is burning. So, let's take a look at typical materials used for home heating in developing countries. We're looking at two types of dung, which burn really well when they're dry, and brushwood. And a quick glance you see the composition of the smoke, if we're assuming that they're all burning just as poorly, is actually dramatically different into the nature of the smoke that comes out of it. You get more variety of the salts and the other compounds from a wood than you do from a dung. That changes the nature of the chemical composition of the air that's being breathed around that fire. If we take a look at the percentage that's in there, nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides, sulfur dioxides, anyone heard of PAHs, polyaromatic hydrocarbons? No. If you spend much time in the environmental realm, PAHs come around because these things don't degrade. They hang around for a long, long time. They're also quite poisonous. This is a favorite of many people, chlorinated dioxins. Dioxins used to be a lot more hazardous and a lot more plentiful in our country and around the world than they are today. Whew. Used to be quite the mess, horrifically poisonous, but a small amount is produced anytime there's smoke. And we get a lot of smoke. We take a look at that mineral composition. These are the big elements that are actually in the smoke, in those particles, in that ash. That's all a part of that smoke. 
I did read a paper that said they've identified every naturally occurring element at one time or another in some form of smoke, which only makes sense because it's in our ground. It ends up in the plants. It ends up getting burned, ends up part of ash and part of particulate. So that makes sense. The thing is, this is what we're breathing. Major carcinogens. Just a quick little, little blurb about this. Benzoapyrene, that's one of the biggies that we actually have a lot more of in the country than we really want to have. It's around all over, terribly poisonous, carcinogenic, known to be. And if you've got wood burning, if you've got leaves burning, if you've got paper burning, if you've got anything that's burning that used to be plant, this stuff is what's getting created. And a few dozen more like it. Now, this is the Tomasco story. Anybody know what a Tomasco is? Anyone? This is one. There's another, another hint. Could look like that. Hmm? A sauna. Good job, yes. In uh, ancient Mesoamerica, Tomaskalteki, I think that's how you pronounce her name, was the guardian of the sauna and the goddess of medicine. Now, think around 1200 BC or so. This Tomasco was used in a curative ceremony. Purify the body. After a battle, or maybe after a ball game, maybe a lacrosse game. It's a sauna. They had saunas way back then. And they were well known for healing, improving health, and women gave birth in them. And they're still in use today. And many of them still use the open fire inside this thing like they used to use way back when. Wow. Well, there's other places they heat up rocks outside and then bring hot rocks in and put them in. So those are safe saunas. But they found that in the highlands of Guatemala, a lot of the indigenous tribes are there still use it in the way that it was historically used. And when they find something like that, oh man, the researchers just go to town because it's, we've got data. So, this is the inside of one of them, and this is what's burning in the tiny room with you. Remember that campfire smoke in the face? Right here. So, 2014, they did a research project. 19 families were involved in this study. And what they did was they took a look and they measured the breath of these people and they took urine samples and then measured the compounds that were in the urine sample. And then that day, because it was a normal part of their daily lives, they used the Tomasco for various amounts, depending on if it was kids or women, men, whatever. They took measurements of how long they were in, how long they were breathing the air of this, and then the next morning, checked the breath and checked the urine again for 19 families. The post-exposure mutagenic potency, that means they measured the stuff in the urine that had the, the potential to be a mutagen, was 1.7 times higher than it was the day before. Okay. Dramatically more than the people that didn't go in at all that day. The exhaled carbon monoxide it's just stuff that was breathed out by them after they weren't in there anymore it was 10 times higher following these. Now, carbon monoxide, you've heard carbon monoxide poisoning, bad, carbon monoxide detectors out there. 
because what it does is it locks up the body's ability to be able to transfer that oxygen into your blood. If you can't get the oxygen into your blood, things like mm, death happen. And it's pretty fast. So carbon dioxide, not good. Both that CO2 level and the amount of time that was spent in the sauna correlated directly with the increase in the amount of these mutagens that were already in their body. And the average con carbon monoxide concentration inside that thing during its use, 10 times higher than the 15-minute World Health Organization guideline. Now, it's not too bad unless you take a look and find out that they only spent from 11 to 98 minutes in it total. Those few minutes spent inside there was enough to make that much of a difference in only one day. The people breathing just that amount of smoke. This is a chart of the global estimated deaths in millions by pollution risk factor. What this means is taking a look at people across the world, how they're dying, what things are causing them to die prematurely. By far, air pollution, primarily caused by aerosols and particulates, have been the cause for an enormous amount of global deaths year after year after year. Water, occupational soil, yes, they do too. But it can be traced right back to the air far more so than any. Now, just to wrap up. You're taking notes, right? Most abundant, cellulose. It's a part of our carbon cycle. We need it. Combustion and pyrolysis, two chemical reactions that occur, create scads of chemical compounds. Thousands and thousands of them and tiny, tiny little bits of matter that go along with it. Incomplete combustion are the source of these tiny bits of matter. And by tiny, I mean really tiny. Two and a half microns or smaller. The chemical components are carried on those particles. So when they breathe and they get all the way into your lungs, those compounds come out with them. And scads of death result from it. So, number one takeaway from all of this. No matter what gets burned, don't breathe it. Smoke bad. I guess I can sum this whole thing up. Smoke bad. Regardless of what's getting burned. The thousands and thousands and thousands of chemicals that are created in there, none of which are healthy, are a normal part of our lives. Now, does smoke play a positive thing anywhere? I mean, I thought about starting this talk off by saying, you know, friends, fourth Scythians, countrymen, lend me your ears. I'm here to bury smoke, not to praise it. Smoke does perform a couple of good things. One is high up in the atmosphere. It seeds raindrops. And we kind of need to have that. And it also deflects a lot of the incoming radiation high up into the atmosphere where a guy from last time, he wants to fly up there. Ain't much up there, but there are smoke particles up there. So we do need it for that. But we don't need so much of it, we don't need it trapped in our house. Fortunately, we don't have that. But a few billion other people on the planet aren't so fortunate. Don't breathe it. But is it okay to eat it? And that's a talk for another time. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope you learned something, and we'll see you next time. Do we have any questions for Mr. Farley? I hope so. I left time for you. Yes, sir.
any form of cellulose, when combusted, creates smoke. To ask how much does cigarette create is like asking how much paper contributes or wood fire. However much is burned is how much it contributes. I have a question. Yeah. How about um, people that vape? Yeah. That smoke. Well, what is vape? They say it's nothing but water. Steam. Someone say steam. Water vapor. Okay, keep going. It's a little bit more than that. Okay. Is vape an aerosol? Yes, maybe, no, no. Okay. What gets vaped? A liquid. Does that liquid turn into a gas or is it carried along in tiny little particles along with the gas that you breathe? It's that. Vaping is an aerosol. And what makes vaping work so well is that those liquid particles are so small, they get all the way down into your lungs where they can deliver their payload of flavors or components or nicotine or whatever it is that you're enjoying with them. It is an aerosol that works really efficiently at delivering chemicals to the body through the lungs. That's its purpose. And that's how it works. Does that answer your question? Are you scaring me? That's, that's, that's physics and chemistry. <laughs> you had a question, sir? Couple. Uh oh. Candles? Candles? Burn wood over here, but there is, you know, candles very commonly used mm -hmm. uh, at, at home. So, any studies with that? In okay. Do candles create smoke? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Is it organic? Is it burning? Yeah, it makes no. Relative concentration, small compared to if you had a campfire in your house. Contributor, sure. Composition, same as any other organic material burning. Just smaller amounts. The other one with your studies in Mesoamerica, because you were doing urine examples, so tests as well, mm -hmm. with the group that you were studying. But any studies with the reproductive system, sperm count? No or? doubt. But that's not my area. Okay. So I left that alone. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, there have been enormous numbers of studies, all aspects of human health related to air quality issues, specifically the high amounts of particulates. There's an enormous body of work yeah. on looking at direct correlations between those with and without exposures to smokes and then which health effects are to that. Right. Massive amounts have gone into the World Health Organization's stats to come up with all of this in order for them to say that this many bodies are directly attributable to that because they had been disqualified because it wasn't these other parts. So yes, there's an enormous body of work there. If you have mm -hmm. any interest in the other health effects of these sure. things. Yeah, huge. as well with the brain, because you know the brain needs the oxygen so much. And mm -hmm. you know, what is it that we're doing when we smoke mm -hmm. with the chemicals for the and brain? And the part? oxygen to the brain part of it is primarily affected by just the carbon monoxide, and that's the gas. When you're talking about the particulate part, those are all that end up being dissolved toxins. The other one with your, uh, we do, and I thought of that when I saw the beef over there cooking, because we have in, in the U.S. a lot of the beef industry mm -hmm. produces a lot of toxins in gas. This is a seminar for another day. Okay. <laughs> so yes, the aspects of what we learn to like and what we consider good, especially in the foods we eat, Different aspect. Other questions? Okay.
So Norman, um, you're going to be going into the innovation quarter. You're going to be coming into our lab. Mm -hmm. What is it exactly that you want to be able to, because we have great equipment in that lab, what is it, it, it exactly that you want to do there? What what do you want to look at? What's is it is it part of your smoke studies or is no. It, no, it's not. It's Something not different. smoke. Okay. <laughs> right. okay. The reason that uh, the Innovation Quarter facility captured our attention is that we've been asked to investigate a plant protein that has been shown to have reactivity to compounds that are irritable to the skin and to the eye. Today, the most commonly used test to determine ocular and dermal irritation are animal tests. They use rabbits, they drop it in their eyes, they'll drop it in their skin, and they'll look for, does it cause irritation and inflammation? And if it does, odds are good, it's gonna do that to humans too. Now because their line of humans lining up to have this done to them is really small, they have to use animals, is the logic. These plant proteins, We've created an assay that has a direct correlation to the results from the rabbit test, from a plant material. But we don't know exactly which protein it is. So the appeal in here is, can these facilities help us to isolate and discover what those proteins are so that we can then take those, purify them better, and have a system that is even more accurate than the 79% accurate rabbit test on which compounds, primarily uh, cosmetics, personal care products, things like that, that would be irritants to human skin. Yes, ma'am. Ask me that differently. Cells. Directly into cell cultures? From where? Plants? The idea was to be completely harm free. A non animal, a plant version of non animal test. That is there a way we can get away from all animals, be they human or human cells, animal cells, or anything, to be able to have a test that can give us the same results, but nothing had to hurt and nothing had to die other than a plant. But, well, I, can, I concur, I concur. And there are many other forms of, uh, of irritation testing. For instance, there's uh, one that uses cow's eyes, but they're from post-butchering. So they're saying, okay, we got plenty of these things, we'll just use those, because nobody's gonna eat them anyway. Well, okay, that's a use of a product that would have otherwise somehow been disposed of or destroyed, and so it's getting a use out, okay. That, that, that's legit. But the thought that we have a plant material that can give us the same results of an animal test, that's got an appeal to it because ultimately animal testing is not a sustainable choice because plants are so much better choice for us to be able to use on this planet. So the, the idea is to be able to pursue specifically that project inside your laboratory using those things to help us better characterize these things and isolate these proteins and say, yes, this is the stuff. It's kind of cool. I'm geeked about it. Yes, sir. Well, and the, the body of data on smoke specifically is enormous. Much of that data has also been used to increase the efficiency of all forms 
of combusted power generation. And to that end, just as an example, currently designed coal-fired power plants have the same net impact in greenhouse emissions as natural gas plants do, both by cleaner burning, less amounts of particulate actually escaping from the process, more efficient combustion and conversion of that energy into the steams that become the electricities we use, as well as the ease with which natural gas is combusted. The part the natural gas thing often gets left out is about two and a half to three percent of all recovered natural gas actually escapes from the mining process straight up into the atmosphere. And methane is so much more of an intense greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. They would have been better off not letting that out than 16 times more CO2. So when you look at the total mass balance, the total chemical balance of the impacts, you find that that technologies that are actively working to reduce fine particle emissions ends up giving us cleaner, more efficient, more healthy air for us to breathe in all areas of the country. And until such time as we can bring those technologies and bring that into developing countries that are ready for it or want that and want to help it, that's basically the reason I started this up. This is we've got knowledge, we've got stuff that they need to have and they can't afford to do it themselves. We can. Let's start taking it there and finding out what can be done with it. Norman, I have another question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and this will be my last. What kind of jobs are there going forward in the, you know, in the future, and present and the future, for uh, technicians that are graduating from community colleges with respect to the environment, with respect to chemistry, and with respect to uh, smoke? What kind of jobs are available? Interested in jobs? That's why you're going to school? Yeah, me too. The, uh, I'm still going to school. Jobs in the environmental field, whether it be water, soil, wildlife, air, are all driven by regulation. And regulations that are put into place to ultimately improve the general welfare of humanity. Until the day comes that we no longer care about the human race, which I hope isn't anytime soon, we will be having regulations that are getting more and more stringent about assuring that we've got safe places to live, safe air to breathe, safe water to drink, safe food to eat, and all of those aspects come into what they call environmental toxicology science. And technicians that have the ability to maneuver, whether it be through biology, which you're a fan of biology, or chemistry, or environmental needs, have the ability to find those jobs in those laboratories, in those research centers, or even in those agencies who are responsible for going and inspecting and ensuring that those agencies' rules are being followed, that they're not dumping stuff into the streams, to be able to test it and understand it. That's that role that is absolutely out there for the technician level environmental uh, jobs, and there are plenty of them. Um, last little tidbit on that, for those that are interested in working with the EPA, the US EPA, the latest numbers are showing that 47% of the EPA's workforce are eligible for retirement with full benefits over the next four years. So over the next four years, they're about to lose half of their 10,000 strong workforce. No, sorry, 13,000 strong workforce over the next four years. There's a lot of openings gonna happen in the EPA, much to their chagrin, but Okay, we'll have a word from Dr. Alan Murdoch. All righty, thank you so much. We're around for uh, Norm here. Thank you. Well, I'm hungry. Ah, me too. 
I love brisket. I so love brisket. Thank you, well, sir. Have some. We got a little plaque for you. Uh oh. So, I'm gonna put this over here on behalf of, on behalf of Dr. Gary Green, and Russ, and the National Center, National Center for Bio Workforce. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you graduated. I graduated. <laughs> I'm legit now. Thank you. Very thank much you. For your time. What an interesting topic. Hey, thank you. That's great.